Hello and welcome from Hamburg in Germany. Uh, my name is Bijan. I'm 54 years old. I'm an old IT guy who studied computer science and artificial intelligence in the late 80s and in the early 90s. Um, after that, I was a researcher at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And until the year 2000, uh, I was IT manager in several startups, spin-offs, and small businesses, uh, which all had to do with uh, data analytics, AI, um, text mining, and topics like this. So today, I'm here in my role as business development manager of Data42. And I want to present what we do uh, with our visual data analytics product for crisis prevention. So uh, a few words on Data42. Uh, we have been founded in 2016 uh, as a spin-off of an established uh, German company with customers worldwide. And we have developed a visual data analytics product that is based on big data, data science, knowledge graph, and AI technologies. And uh, very, very early, we won a German national authority as a customer. And so from the very beginning, uh, the challenges of data analytics for crisis prevention was driving uh, our business and our product development. What we learned very early uh, and very quickly is that our mission can only be fulfilled when we empower the expert with our product and make this our uh, highest priority and foremost goal. So only with such an empowerment of the experts, uh, the way can be paved to leverage more value with uh, artificial intelligence and such technologies. So what do I plan in this talk? Uh, basically, I will provide a very short motivation focusing on relevant data in crisis prevention. I will very briefly explain some relevant tasks in crisis prevention. And for the main part, I want to show examples of visual data analytics in a demo uh, to, to let you see how quick you can work with data and uncover in, in the data what uh, just was hidden. Um, after that, I will summarize and we can go into a discussion. So, what do we see here? Uh, a car crash, a new school, a shooting, a vaccination of a newborn, a protest, heavy rain, what, what do all these things have in common? Uh, we can all be represented as data and such data can help us to understand situations and conflicts. Uh, we can answer questions like, uh, where did the car crash happen? Who funded the new school? How many people died in the shooting? Who were the offenders? Who were the victims? How do vaccinations of newborns evolve? Uh, what happened during the protest? When did the protest escalate? How heavy was the rainfall? Did it come to flooding? And so on. So we learn from data what happened. And then with our human knowledge and experience, we might be able to see what is coming. And we can take the chance for early warning and early action to make crisis prevention come true. So, fantastic. This seems easy, just bring the data. Um, so for example, uh, data from uh, the worldwide governance indicators, from the armed conflict location and event data project, from the global terrorism database. Um, okay, not only that, much more data. I find many relevant information in media, in social media, in using tools uh, like Google and others. And oops, I forgot even more data. Uh, there are these uh, special information from intelligence, 
with all these photos, uh, videos, and audio content, and so much more. So who is able to look at all this information and to make sense from it? Uh, this seems overwhelming, and it is. And uh, even worse, uh, how can we be sure that the information is correct, that the information source is reliable? Actually, we know that not all information is true and trustworthy. So I'm sure uh, you know of these problems and some bad news before the demo. Uh, these problems will not be solved after my talk. And uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence alone will not solve these problems on their own uh, for years to come. So um, back to our mission at Data42. Our question is, can we empower experts with technology to make better use of data? I say, yes, we can, and I want to show you how it works. Uh, before we jump into the demo, uh, just as a short list of the main tasks, what do we need to do in crisis prevention? We need to monitor the situation to be aware and in control. We need to explore the situation to recognize danger signals as early as possible. We need to plan scenarios and make predictions of what might happen. And we need to alert and take countermeasures ahead of time. Data analytics can support experts very well in monitoring and exploration of a situation. Um, prediction and prevention are much harder and real world conflicts are highly complex. Uh, I say this because of uh, the many successes in AI and data analytics in the past, especially uh, with um, uh, IoT and uh, the, in uh, the Internet of Things and industrial analytics. You might know of these successes and uh, these look very promising, but they cannot be easily transferred to forecast for next war or a humanitarian crisis or migration. So, um, yeah, let's empower the experts um, and let's uh, go into an online demo to show some examples. Uh, just as a foreword in the demo, uh, I mainly use data from ArcLED, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, and also our friends from Ubermetrics who crawl and annotate media and social media data were so kind to provide some recent uh, Myanmar data for our demo. So I switch now to the demo, just a second, please. Okay. Um, this is uh, our working desktop. I, I simply start uh, showing you a data atlas. It provides an overview of the available data sources um, and you can check the available attributes and their characteristics. Example, for ArcLED, uh, we can, for example, see uh, we have uh, countries involved and here's the list of countries. That just uh, as a mini introduction to um, the tool uh, covers several data sources and all the data which are integrated here you can work with when you analyze. Um, I want to start with an example looking at the situation in Nigeria and therefore we, we do a search query. Um, we look at uh, data from ArcLED and uh, look into the country, Nigeria. Uh, we look into the years 2014 to 2019. And we want to focus on uh, conflicts uh, 
with a high severity with at least 15 uh, fatalities. So I can do this search. And at the moment you see nothing, but I start the visualization now. Um, use this search and drop it onto this window. So I'll use another layout for this, just a second. Layout for Nigeria is a little bit nicer. And what do we see here? What are the colors? What are these little squares? So each square is one conflict that matches with our search query. So i just show you an example. I drill down to one of the events and you see this is basically a conflict. Um, in this case, a conflict with 400 fatalities, a Boko Haram attack. Uh, they destroyed 16 villages. If I double click that, I get uh, detailed information from Arklet and what happened there. So um, this is what I see. What do the colors mean? The colors basically uh, in this case are defined by the expert, by the person who search in a kind of layout. In this case, the expert decided that fatalities with more when uh, 50 fatalities are red, uh, between 20 and 50 we are orange, um, below they are blue. So you have an indicator of severity. So if I go to a blue event here, it has 15 fatalities in this case. So um, I, will, I will add another few to that. I will use a map to look at the distribution of events uh, in Nigeria. I can combine all of these things. And now I uh, show you, I hope the internet, your internet connection is fast enough to see uh, what I'm doing here. At least at first glance, you, you see uh, the North East in Nigeria has a lot of events with uh, such fatality rates, but also in central Nigeria and uh, to the north east, uh, you have uh, a lot of events. Um, on the west side and southwest, it's, it's rather low. So um, basically what you see immediately, Nigeria has many severe conflicts with more than 15 fatalities in the years 2013 to 2019. It's 764 events, which is basically averaged uh, more than two events each week. So um, from the map, interestingly, you can also uh, drill down, go to a single event, and this immediately is shown here in this graph explorer. In this case, it's a Fulani attack. Um, so you can jump from one to the other side. Um, so this is not so much information right now, but it's an overview. And for the overview, I can also group here, I have a group by year. So we see a little bit uh, distribution over the years. Uh, you immediately see uh, the severe situation in 2014, 2015. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a very horrible Boko Haram terror in this time. I also want to uh, open another visualization to show you the fatalities over time. And I also put link these things together. And in this line chart, uh, we look over the years at the fatalities. Yeah. And what you see here is uh, also the, the peak in 2014 and 15. And generally, you would say, okay, the general situation in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria over time seems to improve. Now, uh, Let's focus a little bit and uh, go into separate directions. So I filter here in the organizations 
uh, for Boko Haram activities and just select uh, two of these organizations to filter. And immediately I uh, see the filters applied to my windows. So still you see the peak in 2014-15. You see that Boko Haram uh, terror is going down in terms of fatalities, but still is severe. Um, and you also see in the map here that uh, Boko Haram is highly concentrated in the northeast. Uh, you have only few events uh, compared in, in central Nigeria. So um, this is what you can detect without uh, knowing all the details and getting an overview and might always decide, okay, now I jump into details. Let's look at another situation in Nigeria. Uh, we know that there are many conflicts between farmers and herdsmen in central Nigeria with uh, Fulani nomads involved. And uh, therefore we focus now on uh, Fulani organizations. And I select two of these uh, Nigeria organizations and filter now. And you get a different picture. Now in the map, you see that these conflicts are uh, mostly in, in central Nigeria. In, uh, in the fatality chart, you see that um, uh, where it seems to be a declining trend, but it goes up and down somehow. And um, yeah, you also see uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's severe conflicts. It's uh, conflicts with many fatalities and there's not only a few of them, there's many of them. So now uh, going into the direction of crisis prevention, um, more looking uh, what happens, what we don't see immediately or, do, or what we do not know. I'll take another approach now. I'll go back to um, the search and use another filter. Uh, basically, I've, I filter out the Boko Haram uh, groups now. So I exclude uh, Boko, Haram, Boko Haram from my search. I also exclude the Fulani uh, groups we looked at. And also um, let's exclude uh, Islamic State in West Africa and filter now. And now something, something interesting uh, happens. Um, we have now uh, a situation with the fatalities, which is different. Um, so uh, conflicts are going up. We have more conflicts. And uh, we also see on the map where the most conflicts are here in the Northwest. And so I use, um, I, I wanted to filter on more recent developments. I forgot that. I limit that to 2016 to uh, 2019. So, and you, you even see better now that the fatalities are going up in, in recent years. Um, and now I want to subgroup here for uh, province. So now uh, what pops, pops up now is uh, this area in 2019 and this area in 2018. If I drill down, this is the Samfara region. And this here is also the Samfara region. So uh, let's look what happens in Samfara and um, do another filter on this province.
So now we are looking at Samfara. We see that fatalities go up, highly go up in this area. We also see that uh, there haven't been so severe events uh, in, in former years. In 2016, only two. In 2017, no event with more than 15 fatalities. And if we look now into, um, yeah, into 2018, uh, just to do a quick check, uh, we see the situation there. Uh, there's a growing problem with uh, cattle rustling, uh, which is a big business for cattle thieves. And uh, we are stealing cattle from the herdsman. And as a reaction to that, Let's see here. another event is also about bandits and cattle raiders and some farmer. Uh, as a reaction to that, the herdsmen are um, uh, organizing themselves uh, in, in militant groups and we are fighting back uh, the thieves and also taking revenge, uh, which leads to, to very bloody events and battles in the land. So what do we see? Um, we see looking at Nigeria, um, which we mainly in our Western world hear the Boko Haram stuff, we see, okay, the situation overall uh, looks better and seems to be uh, declining terror in Nigeria. But if we look closer and uh, see what is happening in certain regions or uh, with certain new organizations and, and groups, uh, we detect that something is coming up, that something is growing, that something is getting more and more severe. And this would be uh, an indicator to act there, to um, alert there, and to start with uh, action in the direction of uh, preventive action. So um, this was the, the Nigeria example. I also want to uh, I want to close this here, just a second. I want to use uh, another example, a more recent example from Myanmar. Um, let's also start with uh, ArcLab data. And uh, in Myanmar, we look at uh, 2021 and 2020. Do the search. So in Myanmar, we also have a, a lot of events. It's almost 5,000 events. Uh, we don't want to look at uh, fatalities in Myanmar. We more want to look at the types of events there and use another layout. And with this layout, basically what you see in, uh, in red, the red events are um, battles, explosions, uh, remote violence. Uh, I put these together into red. Uh, the orange are violence against civilians. Uh, the protests are green. Uh, riots are in light blue and strategic developments are dark blue. So uh, let's also look at the map. I have to go to Myanmar to see. Basically in Myanmar you can see that the events are distributed all over the country. With some hot spots like the big cities. Um, yeah, let's, let's group this year by year, which is uh, already very interesting. Because what do we see here? Um, immediately, 2021 is green. Um, 2020 is, is more red. But 2020, a lot of protests. Um, even you must be aware that 2021 is only three months of data. It's January to March. Uh, 2020 is complete data. So many, many more events. So let's, let's focus on the protests. I would like to uh, 
restrict or filter uh, the event type to protests for a moment. And now uh, we only see the protests, uh, which are already 2,762 events in 2021. And if we now want to look uh, at protests uh, from a perspective of, of violence, um, we want to see uh, how peaceful are the protests or are there very violent protests? Uh, I go into the filters again and use the fatalities to say I want to see protests where at least we had one fatality. And when I filter this again, I see that 2020 there have been no protests uh, with any fatality. And in 2021, we already had 72 events with fatalities, protests with fatalities. And if one, I group that now by month, yeah, you clearly see it only started in February with the military coup and uh, got worse in March. So um, to conclude my demo, I want to also show you uh, an arm. Ah, before that, let's, let's have a look at, not at protests, but at strategic developments because this is also interesting. So strategic developments are um, in most cases, uh, nonviolent activities, um, but often important to observe. I change my view here and, and group by year. You also see that in 2021, there are much more strategic developments. Uh, Again, this is only three months in the year. And if I subgroup this now um, by month, we also see in 2021, uh, it goes up in February and in March, very, very uh, steep, much more such events. Um, finally, I do a kind of uh, subgrouping and look for the arrests, just to let you see um, what happens there. Military in uh, Myanmar started to arrest many people uh, at the beginning of the coup in February, and this uh, kept on in uh, March and uh, more and more arrests were taken. Okay, so much for the outlet data, just a very brief example uh, with other data. I'll do a new search and use some Ubermetrics data, which is media data. Uh, our friends from Ubermetrics sent something, especially for this demo. Uh, you see here it's only 104 events, so this is a, a very uh, simple um, sample set. Uh, interestingly, now with the media data, I have other metadata involved. In this case, for, <laughs> for example, we have something like virality. And now if I, if I sort this by virality, I have the most viral uh, media data here in the top left corner. And let's just uh, jump into that. So we have a different stuff here, which is uh, in this case, a Twitter post. It's a breaking news about the arrest of Wai Mo Nying, uh, who is a young activist, a key figure in the Myanmar protests. And this information is directly linked to the original source. So when we jump uh, in, we can directly jump into the Twitter post uh, that we found here in our tool. And uh, as a quick second example, um, let's take a news article uh, with one from The Guardian, um, also with still a high virality. This is about four young brothers who started uh, to protest peacefully 
um, after the military coup and with uh, ongoing violence from the military, we, we fight uh, back, we throw Molotov cocktails on several police stations and finally had to flee and escaped to Thailand. So, um, so much for the demo part. Um, I jump back into my slides. Uh, yeah, I, I hope that our two slogans, uh, now I see and uh, see it, get it, act, are better understandable for you after you saw these examples. Um, so what do we basically do when we empower experts with visual data analytics? Basically, we help them to keep control over their data in one tool. Uh, we help them to analyze intuitively and quickly and through uh, information from different perspectives. We help them to see the big picture, but also the small relevant details. Uh, we help them to monitor and understand the situation and to discover the crucial, crucial relationships. Uh, we also help them to exchange and report insights. Uh, this is an aspect I did not show uh, in, in the demo. And now the, the interesting or the most interesting part uh, from our point of view is if we bring together the human expertise with the data and such visual data analytics capabilities, we can make better use of data. We can uncover what is hidden. And uh, finally, uh, we have a chance to discover crisis faster and act in time. So um, if this is interesting for you and your organization, uh, the question would be how can we work together and how can we bring together crisis experts, data and visual analytics? Oh, well, we are tech specialists and uh, we are a software product vendor, but we have worked in your field um, and so we can understand your use cases and your data and uh, we like to hear about them. So uh, let's discuss your use cases and data. So uh, I'm almost through with my presentation. Let's start the discussion. Um, do you have any questions? I have a question, Bijan. And hopefully others will put some in the chat. But my, I was actually thinking exactly about use cases as you were speaking. Um, and I also typed a question. I'll put it in the chat for everybody. But I was wondering if, um, so this is a very nice tool for data visualization that would be, I think, very helpful to many of us. Um, what I was thinking is if it's possible to have a kind of custom research environment or you could layer in additional data because some of the questions that people might want to ask if you are sitting in a government or if you're sitting in a donor agency or in a UN country team is what has been the effect of the different interventions that we have been trying in different regions or subregions of a country and if we could map the interventions that that we've been leading against some of the trend data that you have that could be a very nice visualization of understanding if there has been effects and where. It could also be a very good reality check to understand you know, the extent to which interventions actually do map onto the highest risk uh, areas. Um, so I just am curious about that, that use case, um, but also in general, what you see or what, what you, have, have people approached you about particular use cases? And what do you see as the biggest value um, for people like us? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, to, to, to start, um, you are absolutely right. It is um, uh, this cross check with other data and data sources is one of the strengths of the tool. So uh, we, are, we are not providing the data we provide the software and you can put data in. And there's also two ways to put data in. Uh, there might be permanent data you regularly work with, and there might be temporary data 
uh, you want to, to include just for a specific analysis with uh, both is possible. And uh, I think it's very important to look at different data sources uh, for the same uh, topics. Like I, I just looked now at the situation of arrests in Myanmar uh, from the ArcLet point of view, but also from the media side, uh, because only if you, if you take different perspectives and uh, look uh, into, into more information, uh, your confidelity raises. Yeah, you have to cross check more and more because uh, you are more and more um, in the situation of having also wrong data, fake data and, and uh, things like that. So I absolutely agree and this is possible and that is uh, one of the mayor um, advantages we have is that we can put data from different sources under one hood. Now, basically we see that people working with different tools or different data sources uh, simply are so overwhelmed uh, and, and have so few resources that we cannot manage to do the work. Yeah. So uh, one of our biggest advantages is to make that easier accessible, comparable and work with. Thanks. Did this answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay, uh, for, for all of uh, you who, who like this approach and want to know more, uh, for sure, uh, feel free to, to contact me. Um, but, but also if, if this is not for you, uh, I, I very much appreciate all your feedback and what you think. Uh, please let me know, uh, please connect with me via LinkedIn or drop me an email. Uh, we are doing work in the crisis prevention area already and uh, we are seeking opportunities to, uh, to do that, uh, to do more of that. Um, so I'm uh, yeah, keen to hear about your ideas and how you could use something like this and uh, maybe bring up new ideas, how we can elaborate on what we do now and uh, find ways uh, to help. Bijan, I see a few people are commenting in the chat and also asking questions in the chat. Okay, let me let me just stop the screen sharing so I can see the chat. Thanks for the hint. Okay, uh, I, I take I just take one for an example uh, the difference between uh, Power BI. So uh, basically uh, visualization methods uh, you find in many data analytics tools. Uh, exactly the way we do it uh, is unique and new. Um, but what is also different is that we have a specific focus in, on doing uh, crisis prevention and uh, can also uh, relate with our customers in discussions about what is needed in this field. I think this is uh, really a difference to a general product uh, vendor uh, doing this only uh, for, yeah, do, doing this with any, any data analytics. We also use our tool in industry, uh, but also there we are uh, specifically looking at uh, complex high risk scenarios and, and crisis. Um, let me just look if I see another question, or what do I see? Oh, there's a lot of text here. Mm. Can the tool also include a custom research environment? Yes, that was from UPay uh, page. Yeah, I, I uh, commented on that. We can do temporal, temporary imports of data and combine this with other data. Yeah, other data than Arclet. Yeah, I did this at the end with the Uber metrics data, with media data. Okay. And I think we are almost at the end of the session. How can this tool enhance other platform set 
such as Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure actually would be a kind of possible infrastructure uh, to be to be used for our tool. Um, basically, the scenarios we are working in right now, uh, we are not only using public data um, or or data which is official internet or outlet or things like that, but also internal data and have demanded that we install the software on premise. But uh, we are open to also do installations in cloud scenarios. Um, so in, in the Azure environment, at least I'm thinking from an infrastructure point of view, could be an infrastructure to use uh, to, to uh, use our system. I know that the cloud, the big cloud players uh, also have their uh, analytics stacks. Um, what, what we do as um, possible integration of analytics, uh, basically uh, we, we integrate, we do not, we do not develop uh, AI uh, algorithms on our own, but when we do something like prediction, which I also did not show, uh, we use uh, standard tools to integrate that and uh, put that into our tool in a way that experts can, uh, can use it. That's uh, always our first priority. If we cannot integrate it in the ways that experts cannot use it, it's basically not uh, on our short list on our first priorities. Because whenever we have this gap between data uh, scientists and uh, the experts, uh, we see that uh, it is not used in a way that we, uh, it's not used in a kind of daily fashion or, or it's not practical in the way we would like to see it. Okay. Yeah, I, I would like to thank all of you very much for your attention, for taking part, for being here and encourage you, um, please uh, uh, contact me via LinkedIn, ask more questions and let me know what you think. Also, uh, criticism is welcome. Uh, I hope you have a great conference um, and a great time. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Bijan.